If you want to be a clinical psychologist in the UK, you must negotiate the fearsome DeclinSci application. It's competitive, it's drawn out, it's exhausting, but I'm here to help. If you're new, my name's Francis. I'm an incoming first year trainee on the Oxford Clinical Psychology Doctorate. I applied to the doctorate once in 2021. At the time, I had less than a year's relevant work experience and I was halfway through a master's. Somehow I managed to get two interviews and an offer. So I wasn't the perfect candidate by any means, but I know that me last year was absolutely fiending for any advice from successful applicants. And apparently I'm one of those now. So here we are. Here are some things that I think made my application stand out. Let's start by looking on the Leeds Clearinghouse website. I've just clocked, by the way, that it isn't actually a house. It's just two people working in Leeds Uni, but anyway. My first tip is be tactical. At the end of the day, after any of these courses, you will be a clinical psychologist, but each uni's specific admissions process, the content they cover, their balance between clinical and research work, qualitative and quantitative research, and ultimately the types of candidates that end up on these courses can actually vary quite a lot between institutions. So firstly, don't shoot yourself in the foot and determine where you're actually eligible to apply. Some courses look for a minimum of six months relevant experience, some look for 12, some look for 12 at the time of application or at the time of starting the course. I didn't realise that for Royal Holloway, otherwise I would have applied there. Some even look for 24 months relevant experience, paid only, not voluntary. So that master's placement that I paid thousands of pounds for actually counts for nothing in their eyes. Brutal world. In the end for me, these restrictions narrowed down my possible choices of uni by about 20 unis because I had basically no experience. So after determining what you're eligible for, I'd do a deeper dive into whether you'd be a decent fit for the course. And to do that, just take note of which courses have selection tests like the situational judgment test, everyone's favorite test. Some might have a general intelligence test or a group task in an interview. Think about where your strengths might lie. Some courses require you to know or to learn how to drive in order to commute to placements. And some courses require you to move to Liverpool. So think about the sacrifices you're willing to make and maybe the types of tests that you'd be suited to. You can also use the alternative handbook on the BPS website. I'll link everything I mention in this video in the description. You can also use social media, which I'll talk about later. That was a joke about Liverpool. I like Liverpool, please don't cancel me. The alternative handbook is just a collection of statistics about and reports from current trainees on all the Declan side courses. It's actually a thousand pages, um, but it's not wordy. It's just the same questions repeated for every uni. It's just presented incredibly inefficiently, but you can get an idea of how much experience people had before starting the course, what their areas of focus are on the course and how satisfied people are. David Murphy put together a really helpful Twitter thread summarizing the alternative handbook data from last year. So you can see direct comparisons between courses, but of course, Take all of this information with a pinch of salt because the data is made up of the limited number of people who chose to fill out the survey. And let's be honest, right? How many, how many uni surveys have you filled out in your time? I can't speak for every course. I don't even claim to know Oxford's course that well because I've not started yet. But from what I understand, Oxford seems to have quite a young cohort. They seem to take chances on younger applicants with less experience, but a stronger academic record. On other courses, particularly the ones that ask for 24 months relevant experience, I think they're less focused on your academic record. And I presume there it's more common for the trainees to have kids be married, you know, just be a little bit further on in life. So think about where you might slot in. Second, I'd like to give some advice about the big, scary personal statement section. There's no better way to scare a clinical psychology trainee or applicant than by asking them in what way have your work and or research experiences made you a better candidate for training in clinical psychology 3000 character limit. So for this question I'd say bear in mind that in the previous section you've listed out all your relevant experience in work and research so you don't need to re-explain what you've done in any detail. I'd use those little sections underneath your work experience titles to almost give a mini personal statement about that, just like reel off all the responsibilities and duties you had. In this personal statement, I would say it's more important to reflect on those experiences. So what have you learned from them that will make you a good candidate for clinical psychology training? And I think for this, there's a balance to be struck between ticking those clinical psychology boxes and putting yourself forward as a unique person with your own values. By clinical psychology boxes, I mean putting in buzzwords like, here are some that I put in my application, uh, the role of a clinical psychologist in the NHS, interagency work, multidisciplinary teams, therapeutic alliance, supervision, formulation, risk management, community, communication, shared decision-making, service evaluations, and finally, social graces. I've probably forgotten some there, but you'd be off to a good start with those. <laughs> 
keywords in there. For a basic understanding of clinical psychology, I found it super helpful to read the books Surviving Clinical Psychology by James Randall and Formulation in Psychology and Psychotherapy by uh, Lucy Johnston and Rudy Dallas. So going from your experiences, what have you learned about buzzwords like the ones I just mentioned? What debates has this made you ponder in clinical psychology? And in this sense, talk about what's important to you. What are your values as an aspiring clinical psychologist and what has been relevant to your experience? So in my case, I talked about working with people from different backgrounds in the NHS. I also touched on diagnosis versus is transdiagnostic criteria. I think in the current climate, it's especially important to discuss equality, diversity, and inclusion, improving access to clinical psychology, both from a treatment perspective for patients, but also for practitioners and thinking about what the world of clinical psychology will look like in the future. These are some boxes I think are worth ticking. I think to make your application pop, you have to say something to stand out. I knew from the start of my application and talking with my supervisor about it that I couldn't compete with other applicants on quantity or even breadth of experience because I didn't have that much going into it. It's important to think about what is your unique selling point? What makes you stand out? What can you bring to clinical psychology that other applicants can't? Thinking about this for me, I actually brought in computing because I've been doing psychology for five years and I've not met one person who also did computing A-level beforehand. I could also probably count on one hand the amount of men on, on my courses. But anyway, my biggest paragraph in this statement was about this unique selling point, about technology, about computing. I mentioned how my experience offering uh, remote support allowed me to reflect on the future of clinical psychology the role of remote work and technology within this. I wrote that because of my computing background, I'm uniquely placed to harness technology to improve psychological services, scaling treatments up to meet population level disparities while minimizing costs at the same time. And on top of writing what I wish for psychology to look like, I made sure I backed it up with concrete stuff from my placement this year. So throughout my CAMS placement, I was constantly thinking, where can I use my skills to help out the team? Luckily, when it comes to the psychology world, if you know how to use like equal sum in Excel, then you're basically Al Turing. If you can code, then people will think you're the second coming of Christ. So I think getting to grips with coding and and STEM related stuff like statistics can really help you stand out as a psychology student and also give you skills that you can utilize on the job. But I know this is an area that people with a more humanities background struggle with. So if you're looking for a starting point with coding or to feel more comfortable with stats, then you should check out Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant offers a number of online courses perfect for people looking to get into statistics and coding and all kinds of STEM subjects from scratch. From trying their courses myself, I found it super effective to learn through Brilliant because it's interactive. You do hands on lessons in whatever it is, maths, science, computer science. The constant interactive element of it keeps my brain focused. Compared to learning by watching lectures, it's like night and day. If you're just getting started with coding and stats, then I particularly recommend statistics fundamentals and computer science fundamentals. Brilliant presents the concepts in a very accessible way, starting from basic principles and working up to a decent level of proficiency. To get started for free, join the millions of people already on Brilliant by heading to brilliant.org slash Francis Madden, where you can also get 20% off your annual membership. Back to the video, one final tiny tip for this section and all the other long answers is to press enter twice between paragraphs because even though on a Word document, it looks fine with one line break between each paragraph. When I copied it over to Clearinghouse and exported a PDF, it bunched the paragraphs together, which makes it a lot less readable. So a couple of line breaks and you're good. Tip three, use social media to your advantage. I think the main reason I got an offer first time was because of the people that helped me out with this process. So connecting with current trainees, uh, other applicants, clinical psychologists. And if there's one thing you take from this section of the video, it's this Facebook group called UK Clinical psychology doctorate applicants. It's run by Jason, a guy with an absolute heart of gold. He's run webinars with current trainees. He's made spreadsheets summarizing course information and overall created a very useful space where you can get advice from current trainees, book recommendations, book sales. You can just find solidarity with other applicants in the same situation as you, even mentoring from current trainees. So it's worth making a Facebook account for if you don't have one. If you're watching this before the 2nd of September, 2022, there's a webinar on the 2nd of September, 2022 which I recommend going to. If you're watching after this day, I'm sorry to say that you haven't got onto a declan. I'm joking, I'm joking. There's lots of webinars already on YouTube. If you look at the channel, Psychology Made Simple. In one of them, I asked a question, so you can have fun looking for that. And speaking of YouTube, there's a number of channels I recommend of current trainees and clinical psychology people. I'll drop in two today, Sharon B and The Worry People. Both channels are full of great advice and I used them a lot last year. Twitter is also full of great clinical psychology people. As soon as you find one person, you can pretty much find them 
more because you just do a little stalk of who they're following and who they're retweeting. Twitter is also a good place to follow the accounts of service users who are documenting their experiences in the very services you'd be working in as a clinical psychologist. And I'd like to think that this helps you stay in touch with the current issues in the field as they're happening. Finally, you can use LinkedIn to look at people on the courses you're interested in, what sorts of experiences people had before their courses, how they worded their descriptions, just to give you an idea of how you might want to word your experiences in your application. So through social media and reaching out to people in the real world, Jokes, who wants to do that? We move on to tip number four, which is seek feedback, but not too much. So I really recommend getting, if you can, a current trainee and a clinical psychologist to look over your application. For me, the feedback I got literally transformed my first draft. And if you can also get your hands on someone's successful application from a previous year, then even better uh, just to draw inspiration and see how they word things. So feedback, good. But remember that the statement still needs to sound like you because at the end of the day, you're gonna be the one that's doing the course and not them. So I recommend send out one draft to everyone to get feedback instead of getting feedback from one person, changing it, sending it for feedback from another person, changing it and so on, because then your statement kind of slowly morphs into something you don't even recognize anymore. When you get feedback on the same draft from everyone and you'll realize how different everyone's feedback is, one person will say you need to have this and the next one will not even mention that. So I think it's good to just collate everyone's ideas and then you can pick and choose what you would like to change, which feedback you'd like to concentrate on. I think if you do it like that, it will still sound like you. Tip number five is no publications, no problem. When I first saw the dreaded research question, I thought, I haven't presented at a conference. I haven't got any publications. So should I leave this section blank? Some people might tell you otherwise, but I'm going to say the answer is no, because the question has one saving grace and it's this word. Dissemination is such an open term. If you have a research project that isn't yet published, I'd put it down. I'd put it down and put in prep or not yet published, submitted for publication. Just have something in that section. And academia aside, have you presented anything at work, in uni, in school. I literally put a school EPQ presentation from year 13 on my form. Even if it's on Zoom to like 10 people, it's dissemination. I'm actually disseminating to you right now. Can you feel that? I think social media is a class way to disseminate information because there's zero barrier to entry, both as a creator and a consumer. Whereas academia is just mired in paywalls and like who reads academic papers anyway. So if you don't have one already, start an Instagram page, a TikTok page, a YouTube channel, because talking about the experiences you've got so far is probably of value to quite a lot of people. Basically just have a broad idea of what dissemination is. Tip six is gains, which I've got a lot of, as you can see. What do you hope to gain from training as a clinical psychologist? A band six salary. Hmm. Same. But for this question, think about what is the decline going to offer you that you couldn't get just by volunteering at Samaritans or doing CBT training, some kind of psychotherapy training or something else. The way I tackled this question was emphasizing that on the doctorate, you do clinical work using multiple therapeutic modalities and not just one, working with people anywhere across the lifespan from kids all the way to older adults, people with learning disabilities, whilst developing your research skills. As a trainee clinical psychologist, you're both a user and a producer of research in what is termed a reflective scientist practitioner. So I, I just said I was hoping to gain that basically. It's good to do a bit of additional reading about what a clinical psychologist is. Again, I recommend those books I mentioned earlier. I say that as someone who reads nothing, like I read Twitter and watch YouTube videos. So if you do read two books, I would suggest those two. Also in my last video, I interviewed a clinical psychologist. So after you've watched this, check that out and hear what it's like from the horse's mouth. Tip seven is have a life. Here I'm talking about the questions, other information about yourself, such as activities and interests apart from psychology. And are there any periods of adult life not accounted for in the experience and qualification section, e.g. traveling in South America? I think this is a poignant summary of how middle class this field is. This is the first example they thought of as to why you might not be in work on a nice little uh, gap year in South America. So for these questions, I didn't put about my experiences traveling because traveling in Cornwall doesn't have the same ring to it. I think it's important to be genuine, to show that you're capable of winding down and not thinking about clinical psychology 
24 hours a day because as an applicant that is a strength and not a weakness the work is going to be intense and so you need to be able to take a step back so i literally put that i play five aside football and go to the gym but i think this is also an opportunity to cheekily sell those soft skills that they want to see in a clinical psychologist for example i emphasized gaining leadership and teamwork skills in the community by volunteering in a charity shop and doing ncs uh, i was 15 but it doesn't matter and i also talked about communication skills by mentioning my interest in public speaking and drama this youtube channel is the product of a failed acting career because no one wanted me on there on their plays at Cambridge, but we'll let that slide. Tip eight is on self-disclosure. So pertaining to the question, are there any other factors relevant in assessing your application? Please give brief details here. I think self-disclosure can give the statement a more human feel, whether that's about growing up in a minority group with a disability or experience of mental health difficulties in oneself, in family, friends, uh, or all three if you're lucky. Obviously disclose what you're comfortable with sharing, but if, if I think about the way the doctorate's going, courses are trying to diversify their intake, even if their faculty members are basically entirely white. For example, myself as an ethnic minority from a low socioeconomic background trying to get into this field, I think mentioning this can't have been anything other than helpful. Whether it's like the race card, the mental health card, the whatever card, like play every card you have because people deserve to appreciate the barriers you've overcome to get to this point where but even applying to the deacon, that is a big step to take. And if a course doesn't take that into account and doesn't appreciate that, then they don't deserve you anyway. Tip nine is references plus. So this is the only section of the application form that is out of your hands. If we look at the questions, they're kind of brutal. Like rate the applicant from one to five compared to other applicants you've submitted references for. What little can we control here? Firstly, obviously picking people who know you well enough to be able to provide substantial answers because if they're just capable of writing like very good under those like paragraph questions, I imagine that's not very helpful, right? So I think it's important to communicate to your referee if they haven't done this before, that the process is very competitive. So send them this video by David Murphy. I'll link it in the description. It's him addressing the referee, telling them how it is. Like on these one to five questions, you basically need to rate the candidate five or like four are the lowest for every single thing. Make sure you do this and like let them know about the facts you're applying to the doctor early. You want to give them time to write you a good reference. You want to be on their good side so they can give you a nice, some nice ratings. Don't spring a reference on someone at the last minute. That is... In my experience, that's um, pissed some people off. Tip number 10 is remember the odds are in your favor. The Declan application process has a reputation for being extremely competitive. You hear of people applying five, six, seven times before getting on. That's probably the one drawback of social media. You can get quite disheartened seeing how many people get rejected. And of course, when you look at the stats on a per uni basis, your odds of success are like one in 20. It's obviously rough. And of course I'd go into this with high hopes, but low expectations. However, consider that applying to four unis with odds of one in 20, the probability of you getting at least one offer becomes one in five. And obviously one offer is all you need, right? Your odds in 2021 applying were 22% of success, which isn't like horrendous. You've watched this video, so you're better than a lot of applicants just going in blind without any external advice. And secondly, your odds are actually even better this year because they increased the funding for the year I applied. There are like 30 current first years at Oxford, but when I start, there'll be 45 of us going into first year. So they're increasing the funding quite significantly and they're increasing it again for this year's application. So that is the one silver lining of the world we live in, that mental health services have become stretched enough that they are absolutely fiending for clinical psychologists right now. So they're increasing the places again, the odds are going to be even better. And really, I think the reputation of the Declan as this impossibly hard course to get onto stems from the many years before the funding was increased to where your odds were very long, like one in 25 per course. The worst thing you can do is not apply because that makes your odds zero. And that brings me to the end of the video. Good luck if you're applying this year. And remember, there's no one size fits all candidate. If you read even just two people's personal statements, you'll realize how differently people have approached this application process. And remember that the outcome of this does not determine your worth as a person or even as a practitioner. There's people I know who have not got on that would be incredible clinical psychologists. Every year, I think so many people are more than qualified for this and don't get on. And I see that as a loss for clinical psychology rather than them. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video do check out their courses in the description. If you're interested in more content about uni or clinical psychology, I've made a video about my experiences getting onto the doctorate and interviewed an actual clinical psychologist. So feel free to check those out and I'll see you very soon with another video.